Not all stories have happy endings, and not all plans turn out the way that you would want them to. This is sadly the case with Ralph Bakshi's movie career. The 1980s and early 1990s were never kind to Ralph as much as the 1970s were. Even when things seemed to look bright and things might possibly pick up, life would always find a way to troll him and say, No, I'm just kidding! You're not gonna get success that easily! However, even without animation and even after that time, Ralph would actually, would still find a way to actually be happy with himself. Again, even without animation. So, consider this as a bittersweet ending to our story. But first, let us go back a little bit to when Fire and Ice was released. Because when that film was finished, so was Ralph's creative energy. There was nothing for him left to keep him going. Most of the artists he admired and worked with are dead, Hollywood still viewed him as a controversial director that's too risky to work with, and he was no longer the animation superstar like he was during the 1970s and now viewed as old-fashioned. No matter what idea he would come up with, it would end up being abandoned by his depression. He would try and fail to make film adaptations of Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, The Fan Man, Maggie, A Girl of the Streets, Mike Hammer, The Warm Orboros, even a Sherlock Holmes story with anthropomorphic animals. It had gotten so bad that he even rejected opportunities that were handed to him, like saying no to Ray Bradbury to direct a movie version of Something Wicked This Way Comes, or hand over the rights to Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep to Ridley Scott so that he would later turn it to Blade Runner. However, one that really caught his attention was Catcher in the Rye. Since in his current situation, he felt a strong connection with the book's protagonist, Plus, he saw all the potential with the 1950s setting and how to incorporate live-action segments. He knew he was the right man to make a film adaptation out of it, and decided to write the author J.D. Selinger a letter to get the film rights and to have his blessing. However, Selinger is very well known to reject any and all requests for a Catcher in the Rye adaptation, and sadly, Ralph's was no different. The author told him that while he really appreciated the letter and saw his potential, it's just that Salinger felt that it's impossible to adapt his story in any other form. This ultimately led Ralph to leave Hollywood and focus on becoming a painter and more of a family man. He did try to sell a screenplay for a live action film at the time called If I Catch Her I'll Kill Her that is based off of his first marriage, but he didn't get much luck from the studios. From then on, he would be at his home in New York, continuing his paintings and making sure he can straighten himself out of all the stress of show business. But then, in 1985, he received a phone call that would change everything. It was from Tony King, the manager of the Rolling Stones, who asked Ralph if he could make an animated music video for their cover of Bob and Earl's Harlem Shuffle, which he said yes and immediately got back into animation. However, that also meant that he would go back to madness, and the production of Harlem Shuffle was absolutely insane. His plan was to have a narrative story with live-action footage and animate the portion that had the song itself. But the live-action shots could only be scheduled for just one day, the band's flight got delayed by a snowstorm, cameras were crossing paths where they see each other in the shots, and there was heated drama between Mick Jagger and Keith Richards. Not only that, but the animation department had no choice but to crank up the speed of the production in order to deliver the entire piece of animation in a matter of a few weeks. And to top it all off, the deadline was coming at them real quick, since they had to make it in time for the 1986 Grammy Awards for the Stones Lifetime Achievement Award, and they were really tight on the budget where Ralph had to pay any extra fees himself. Because of all this, the team had to sacrifice any sense of continuity within the plot of the music video. But at the end of the day, Ralph successfully finished the project on time. But then, another phone call came, this time from president of TriStar Pictures, Jeff Saganski, who was interested in a project that Ralph's team was developing called Bobby's Girl, and gave him $150,000 to make a full pitch. 
For this film, Bakshi wanted to give the spotlight to an up-and-coming artist that showed a lot of potential and did a great job as the animation director and character designer of the Harlem Knights music video, John Chris Felusi, who would later be known as the creator of the Ren and Stimpy show and a creepy pedophile who infamously dated and had sex with a girl since she was 15 and he was around 40 with a very abusive attitude and often preys on underage teenage girls. Seriously, this is a very disturbing man. He needs help! Anyways, while the team worked hard on developing this new movie, they suddenly hit a roadblock when Sagansky left Tristar and the new heads weren't into Bobby's Girl. Even when they tried to re-pitch it as a film set in Hollywood's golden age called Susie Loves Bobby, it didn't work out. However, the gang was not ready to give up. Ralph had one more chance to make a project happen. Otherwise, he would just go back home to his family and paintings. On April of 1987, Bakshi, Chris Felusi, Eddie Fitzgerald, Jim Reardon, Lynn Naylor, and Tom Minton all were brainstorming ideas for TV shows to pitch to the head of CBS's Saturday morning block, Judy Price. When the time came, Ralph threw everything and presented all his pitches, but unfortunately, none of them stuck, and Price said no to all. It wouldn't be until the last second when Ralph spontaneously said, I own the rights to Mighty Mouse. Technically, that was a flat-out lie, but she didn't know, and it was CBS that had the rights anyway, so it all worked out, and Ralph had a new series to work on. Fast-forwarding to September of the same year, Mighty Mouse The New Adventures made its premiere to great ratings and praise from both audiences and critics. That is, until... I know someone else like that. <sighs> Let's just say that Mighty Mouse snorted in some controversy that led the series to get cancelled a year later. Unfortunately, it was like coonskin all over again. The incident left a toll on Ralph, and it lost him an opportunity to make a 39-episode series based on his comic, Junk Town for Nickelodeon, which executives also felt like his goal to make it more jazzed up with a style from the 1920s and 1930s was too different to make sense. The only thing that came out of the planned show was the pilot, Christmas in Tatertown, the channel's first original animated special. Luckily though, PBS would offer him a new chance to redeem himself by giving him $50,000 to make a half-hour live-action film for the series Imagining America called This Ain't Bebop, which gave him his creative groove back. So much so that not even a car crash could stop him from finishing the project. Seriously, the poor guy was all bandaged up and covered in stitches while in post-production. Once his body recovered and Bebop was done, he would go on to create two more animated projects. One was a special that he was proud of called Dr. Seuss's The Butter Batter Book, which the doctor himself storyboarded and was happy with the end result, and another was a failed pilot that he was totally embarrassed about called Hound Town. However, even if they brought in some decent money, Ralph wanted to make one more big project, something that can cap off his career with a bang so that he can finally retire and be a full-time painter. And that would ultimately lead him to create Cool World. It's the story of Frank Harris, a World War II veteran who works as a cop in Cool World, a crazy animated universe where the cartoons are called Doodles and real humans like Frank are called Noids. One doodle in particular, Holly Wood, dreams of becoming annoyed in the real world, and she plans to do so by bringing her cartoonist creator Jack Deebs into Cool World and have sex with him. Now Frank has to stop Holly from pursuing her own selfish needs in order to save the barrier between the real world and Cool World before things get too chaotic. While many people nowadays would refer this as a Roger Rabbit ripoff, and that's from some of the nicer comments about it, the original idea was far different than what the project ultimately became. Ralph Bakshi's original Cool World was a live-action animation hybrid horror film where a human guy and a cartoon girl named Debbie Dallas have sex, and years later, the hybrid kid that came from that would pursue to kill his father for abandoning him. When he pitched this idea to Paramount Pictures in 1990, the executives loved it and immediately greenlit the film on the spot. Soon afterwards, Ralph and his gang headed to Las Vegas where they would spend three months building sets that would take the background paintings of Barry Jackson and blow them up 20 feet high so that Ralph could capture the feeling of a living walkthrough painting. 
However, while the crew was preparing the movie, something sinister was brewing in Paramount. One of the producers of Cool World was Frank Mancuso Jr., the son of then-president of Paramount, Frank Sr. When he started producing throughout the 1980s, almost all of his works were horror films, most namely the Friday the 13th sequels. When he saw that his next movie to produce was yet another horror film, he felt unpleased and had a need to escape the horror genre. So, without telling anyone, he hired screenwriters Mark Victor and Michael Grace to create a brand new script that would be nothing like Ralph's original project, on top of toning it down to a PG-13 rating instead of going with a hard R. By the time Ralph and the team got the new script, the director was told that he had no choice but to make the film, or else Paramount would sue him. At that point, Ralph did what many directors dreamt of doing. Punching a producer in the face. <laughs> However, the production arguments would not end there. There was also a lot of heat regarding the film's stars. Originally, Ralph wanted to have Drew Barrymore to play Debbie Dallas, now called Hollywood, and Brad Pitt to be the cartoonist that would literally bang his drawing Jack Deebs. Of course, another fight would ensue. But then they agreed to keep Brad Pitt, now playing as the cop Frank Harris, and switch the casting to Gabriel Byrnes as Jack Deebs and Kim Basinger as Holly Wood, since at the time, she was one of those names that can make big box office money. Even though Paramount had more control than him on many aspects of the production, Ralph was relieved that he could still do whatever he wanted with the animation. His goal with the Doodles of Cool World was to pay homage to the cartoons of his old workplace Terry Toons and of Fletcher Studios, known as the home of Betty Boop and Popeye. Throughout production, none of the animators were ever given that revised script of that movie. Nobody would ever know what would be the purpose of their work, since the only orders they got from Ralph was just to make something funny and to do whatever they want. This is why many scenes in the film are filled with weird cartoon characters running wild with no connection to what's happening in the plot. It does make me wonder though if many productions to recent animated films faced a similar issue. Because, I don't know about you, but pointless chaotic cartoony moments seem to be a popular thing to do! I guess Cool World is more influential than I thought! On a side note, while the Doodles in Cool World are all original characters made for the film, there is one that came from a previous cartoon. Many Ralph Bakshi enthusiasts would notice a strong similarity between Nails and Sydney the Spider from Ralph's Christmas in Tatertown, especially when they both have a similar design and are both voiced by Charlie Adler. Oh, that was great, just great. I've been trying to take over Paddock Down for years, but never like that. And did I ever tell you about the time I took up with the most delightfully stacked hussy from the project? Yeah. Right. We're two boys. Of course, as it is a Ralph Bakshi film, there was a moment when the movie received quite the controversy. But thankfully, it wasn't Ralph's fault this time. A key part in the promotional campaign is with Holly's sex appeal, and the biggest attempt to present it, literally, was by putting a 75-foot cutout of her on top of the Hollywood sign. The result made locals furious as they were protesting that it was considered offensive to the women of Los Angeles. But when it was released on July 10th, 1992, things would get worse for Cool World, as it became a total failure. Critics were appalled by the absolute broken writing and unappealing characters, and the mix of live action and animation felt more unconvincing and amateurish. Even audiences felt let down because of its PG-13 rating, and wanted the film to be even more wild and raunchy than what it ultimately became. As for the box office, it only managed to get half of its budget with around $14 million domestically. On the bright side though, at least the soundtrack got some praise with songs from Moby, Electronic with Neil Tennant, and David Bowie. As Paramount tried to sell the movie as a more down and dirty Who Framed Roger Rabbit, it was ultimately rejected for not being cool enough. While Cool World didn't go as planned for Ralph Bakshi, he still had some energy to make more projects. 
However, it was evident that his passion was going less towards filmmaking. A year after his last film was released, Lou Arkoff, the son of heavy traffic producer Samuel Z. Arkoff, called Ralph to see if he could make a live-action low-budget movie for his Rebel Highway series. Like what he did for many years, he decided to pitch him his old script of If I Catch Her, I'll Kill Her, and this time, it was accepted! The film was released on September 16th, 1994 on the TV channel Showtime under the new title Cool and the Crazy. And the stars were two up and rising actors that would later make a name for themselves, Alicia Silverstone and Jared Leto. A year later, Ralph would get back into animation where he was contacted by Fred Sieber to create animated shorts for What a Cartoon a program where animators could create whatever cartoon they want with no network interference for the new Cartoon Network. The result came in the form of two cartoons called Malcolm and Melvin and Babe He Called Me, which both starred a cockroach named Malcolm and a clown named Melvin. Both tunes would later be released at the end of November 1997. When Ralph was done with them, another call came from HBO to create an animated series aimed exclusively for adults, since interest for one began to spark after Trey Parker and Matt Stone brought out their video Christmas card, Jesus vs. Santa. What Ralph and his team came up with is the sci-fi anthology series Spice City, which came out a month before South Park on July 11th, 1997, making it the first animated series made for adults only. While critics may not have enjoyed the tales told by Raven, it did actually receive some strong ratings and was even picked up for a second season. However, when HBO made that move, the company also wanted to fire the writing team that Ralph handpicked himself, which also included his son Preston. He refused to let them go and the show ultimately got cancelled with only six episodes made. Afterwards, Ralph finally called it quits. Ever since he was done with Cool World, he always had a strong need to just go back to his paintings, since that gave him a lot more satisfaction and control of what he was creating. So once Spice City was over, he decided to become a full-time painter he always wanted to be, and even moved to New Mexico in 2002 to give him more inspiration for his art. Throughout the 2000s, he actually became more of a successful painter, even having his works be featured in the 2001 film Vanilla Sky. However, even when painting, Ralph never let go of his animation side. That will always be with him no matter what. In fact, he became an animation teacher like at the School of Visual Arts in Manhattan in 2000. But back in New Mexico, he was also thinking of ideas for potential animation projects, like a sequel to Wizards or an original film called The Last Days of Coney Island. It wouldn't be until 2012 when Bakshi released a new animated short called Trickle Dickle Down that had reused animation from Coonskin. The whole purpose for the short was to be a political commentary speaking against then Republican presidential candidate Mitt Romney, and it was the first short that was part of the Bakshi Blues series. However, it was also the only Bakshi Blues short since there were no others that came out since. Heck, I can't even find Trickle Dickle Down on the internet anymore. Seriously, here's the video. Well, at least I remember seeing it, so I am sure it did exist once. Wait, what? Can it really be? A natural cotton sweater? A mint Romney sweater for me? I done about everything. Size shoes? <laughs> huh. Guess it really is true when they say that once you put something on the internet, it's there forever. As time would move on and technology quickly became more advanced than ever, Ralph became more serious about developing The Last Days of Coney Island. And on February of 2013, he officially opened a Kickstarter campaign in the hopes of crowdfunding $165,000 for the project. With a total of 1,290 backers, the campaign ended up earning $174,195. 
It wouldn't be until almost three years later, on October 29, 2015, that the 22 and a half minute short would be released on Vimeo and uploaded for free on YouTube a year later on October 13th. From then on, Bakshi and his movies would find a newfound cult status with the new generation and are often celebrated for his works with screenings, interviews, and public appearances. In fact, his family is continuing his animation legacy. Not necessarily as animators, but two of his grandkids, Miles and Nina, provided their voices for a few projects at DreamWorks Animation, with the biggest one being the Oscar-nominated The Boss Baby, directed by Cool World animator Tom McGrath, with Miles as one of the main stars. Rather it be with his new paintings or with his old films, Ralph will forever be known to go through many struggles but ultimately come out as an animation pioneer. Bye-bye, folks. Have a nice life.